So welcome to today's uh, Meow seminar with Albert Atsirias, who's going to tell us about the theory of algorithmic proof complexity. Albert, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jacob. Uh, thanks for the invitation, and it is a great pleasure to, to be virtually in Scandinavia. I don't know if I should say Copenhagen or Lund, or I don't know where exactly, or somewhere in the middle. In any case, virtually there. And it's also very nice to see so many familiar faces, and uh, thank you very much for coming. So some of you may recognize the title from oh, another talk I gave. In fact, this is a version of a talk I gave in ICALP in Paris earlier this year. And it's basically a survey talk uh, where I try to explain my view of proof complexity. And while I explain this view of proof complexity, I will see that it has evolved a little bit into some trying to understand algorithms in, from two senses. On, in one sense, proof complexity has been used to analyze some algorithms and some heuristics, and I will discuss a little bit of that. But then I claim I can also use proof complexity to give some algorithmic insights, and we'll get into that towards the end of the talk, hopefully. Okay, so let's get started then uh, with the history of uh, proof complexity. And we're going back uh, to many years, to the 20th century. And here we see two giants. On the left is uh, Kurt Gödel, on the right is von Neumann. And it's well known, the story is that von Neumann was sick uh, at home and Gödel wrote this letter to his friend and colleague at the time. And in this letter, he was asking some mathematical questions after uh, some more uh, social uh, uh, discussion. And he, he started asking mathematical questions, which today we can think of as, of as the first time that a question on the proof length of uh, proofs, the, the length of proofs was considered as a mathematical object of interest. So here you can see it's highlighted. He was asking about the question whether one can decide if there is a proof of a formula F in predicate logic in this case of length N. And he was thinking of length as the number of symbols. And he argued here that, uh, well, this measure, the, the longest, uh, the length of the longest proof of a formula, which he called phi of n, would be quite interesting. And he even con conjectured or speculated that maybe one can decide whether there is a proof of length n in time linear or maybe quadratic. And that would be very interesting. So what uh, Gödel here was uh, referring to is uh, two questions that we now call um, the proof search and the proof complexity of, of a tautology. And so it, he was referring to predicate logic, but in general, you can talk of any language that has a semantics where you can talk about truth. And so the proof search would be a problem where you're given a tautology in this language, and the question is to find a proof. And the other question is about the length of this proof, and that's the complexity of the proof complexity of this tautology. So what is the complexity of this simplest proof? And simplest is measured in some way, like Gödel was measuring by the length, meaning the number of symbols to represent the proof. And usually we have the language fixed and we have some proof system fixed, which is sound and complete. And the complexity measure is also made clear uh, when we talk about uh, these things. So. In modern terminology, uh, this is what we call an abstract proof system under the length measure. So we have a set of strings A, and we're given this X, and then the problem of uh, proof search is to find a proof. And that means finding a Y such that some verifier condition P, X, Y holds. And this verification condition uh, should uh, be verifiable quickly in polynomial time. So recognizing proofs is very fast. Finding them is not so clear how to do. And the other thing is, uh, what is the length of its shortest proof? And in order to be sound and complete, what you want is that this verifier, this P, gives you this property that all the Xs that are in the set have some proof. But notice here that I'm not bounding the size of the proof and just saying there exists a proof, which has to be finite. That's the only condition. And, uh, and the verification has to be polynomial in the length of the input and the proof. So this goes well beyond proof search or NP search because the proofs need not be polynomially bounded. So for example, in the predicate calculus, um, there is no a priori bound, no a priori um, computable bound on the length of uh, shortest proof. While in propositional logic, uh, depending on the calculus, you can 
uh, you can put a bound, and usually it's an exponential bound at most, or the length of the proof. But what I mean to say here is that different languages, of course, they have different theorems, they have different truths, st true statements. And for both problems, if you have different calculus, or different calculi for predicate logic or for propositional logic, each different calculi gives you a different problem. So gives, this gives you a huge uh, collection of, of problems that one would like to, to classify. And again, this is well beyond NP search. We're not talking about NP search problems, but just search problems in general. It could range from, from uh, undecidable to exponential time and, and other things. So, so this is precisely what Steve Cook wanted to do in his 1971 paper, the famous paper where he proved that SAT is NP complete. In that paper, he was actually interested in uh, what is yellow here, uh, a method of measuring the complexity of proof procedures for the predicate calculus. And this is what he discusses in the paper. Uh, and along the way, he proves that the uh, SAT is NP complete and he poses the question of P versus NP. So really, this is the, the thing that uh, Cook was after in 1971. I realized just recently that in fact, it's this paper of 1971 is now older than at the time the papers by Gödel were, right? I mean, this, now it's 51 years old and 71 uh, compared to Gödel paper, Gödel paper is 36. So this is only this is 35 years old. So uh, the progress in the P versus NP question is much lower. Because also that uh, Gödel's paper was 36 years after uh, Hilbert posed the question of, um, of uh, whether there is a, a complete calculus for, for arithmetic. Anyway, so uh, so let's let's then uh, continue. So Cook wanted to to found the theory of um, of proof complexity. So he, he said that uh, the field of mechanical theory improving badly, badly needs a basis for comparing the dozens of procedures which might appear in the literature. And this is what uh, he went on to do uh, years, a few years later with uh, Rekov when he um, focused on propositional calculus. That was already quite rich because there are many proof systems one can consider. And then he decided to, uh, he defined the notion of simulation. So we say that a proof system Q, P simulates another proof system P, if there is a polynomial time computable function that maps proofs in P into proofs in Q for the same X. And this is the kickoff of proof complexity for comparing proof systems by their, their strength. So this defines a partial order on proof systems. And then we can say this proof system is stronger than that other proof system. So, in fact, the hierarchy of proof systems for propositional logic uh, has been studied uh, in depth, and it was realized early on that what is most important about the proof system is not so much the rules that are used, but uh, which kind of formulas we are allowed to reason with. So here in the middle, I put resolution because it's one of the most uh, famous proof systems, and also because it sits somewhere between the theoretical setting and the practical setting, uh, somewhere in the middle. And resolution happens to have this um, uh, property that it's interesting to, to both communities. And I think that's, that's beautiful. So I was saying that resolution uh, works with clauses. This is the, the kind of formulas with which we reason. And then other proof systems have more powerful formulas, like for example, KDNF formulas. Uh, this is the formulas we can reason with in RESK or KDNF Frege, or bounded depth formulas more generally. These are formulas with a bounded number of alternations between conjunctions and disjunctions of unbounded fanning. And threshold formulas, in this case, we would allow also um, threshold gates, which or majority gates, like uh, saying at least half of the inputs are true. This gives you more expressive power. And we know this well from, proof co from, from computational complexity and improved complexity, it also makes sense to, to look at this thing. Frege would be proof systems that reason with uh, standard formulas and extended Frege would be reasoning with circuits. Now, if we go below resolution, there it doesn't make much sense to restrict clauses any further. So what we do instead of restricting clauses is restricting the proof graph. So resolution, Proofs are basically graphs where you have a 
edges from the premises to the conclusions, saying this clause follows from this to other. And then you can say this graph takes a certain shape. And for example, a tree, if this graph is a tree, the proof is a tree, then we say it's a tree-like resolution proof. Regular resolutions would be the case where the graph is read once in a certain sense that I will define later. So just to make sure resolution, what is the proof system? We have these clauses, C or X and D or not X. These are clauses that have several literals, but they have one clashing literal, X and not X. So in this case, from these two premises, we can infer the resolvent just by cutting out the clashing literal. And of course it's sound because X has to be either true or false. Now, as I said, uh, we have these proofs that we can see as graphs. So technically a proof, you have a set of hypotheses. These are the clauses of your formula and you keep inferring new clauses. For example, clause DL follows from clauses DJ and DK. These are the left and right premises. And this determines the structure of the proof graph. And every single clause is either of this form or is one of the hypotheses. And in the end, we have the empty clause, meaning that uh, we are producing a contradiction. Therefore, we have refuted or we have proved the unsatisfiability of F. And now the proof length uh, of is in the case of resolution, that's what we denote by S DAC. And we call it DAC because this graph is in general acyclic. But other than that, there is no other condition. So it's a directed acyclic graph. But when we restrict the graph to be a tree, then we denote it by S3. So that's the length of the shortest resolution, tree-like resolution refutation of F. And another measure that is important is the width, which, in which we measure for every clause, we measure how many literals are there. And that is going to be the width of a refutation. Of a refutation is going to be the length or the width of the long, longest clause. And then the width of refuting a formula is the minimum width you can achieve among all refutations. Okay? And here you can see that uh, whether you have DAC-like or tree-like resolution refutation, it doesn't matter because you can always take a DAC proof and unfold it into a tree and that doesn't change the width of the clauses. So the width doesn't care about whether it's tree-like or not. I repeat, the width is the length of the longest clause. Very good. So these three measures, in fact, they are related in, in quite non-trivial ways. And here is a sample result of this kind where uh, the study of structural proof complexity, meaning the lengths of proofs by studying measures like uh, width and size and so on, the structural theory of proof complexity gives you some consequences for proof search. And this is quite non-trivial, so let me state this theorem of uh, Benson and Victorson, very influential in the field, which says that if you have a 3CNF formula with uh, n variables, then you can lower bound the minimum proof length in terms of the width, the minimum width of refuting the formula. So for example, the tree-like refu refutation size is always exponential in the minimum width of refuting the formula F. And for that, for general resolution, that DAC means directed to cyclic graph, so, so general resolution. There is also an exponential relationship with the width, but slightly weaker. So I can read it here. It's exponential in the square of the width divided by the number of variables n. So now this, notice that the width, how long can the width be? Well, it cannot be more than n because there are no more than n variables. And you don't put uh, clashing literals in a clause. So you have the width is at most n, but it can be at least as large as n or n over two or some constant times n. So when this happens, that the minimum width is linear in the number of variables, then you get here a square function divided by n. So you get a linear in n and that's exponential in n. So by proving a width lower bound on the formula uh, refutation, the, the width refutation of the formula, if you prove a linear lower bound, linear in the number of variables, you get an exponential lower bound on the general repetition length. So this was for proving lower bounds. And that's very cool because then it tells us that we understand this measure. But it also has other consequences. Like, for example, it, there's an immediate corollary for proof search, which is not obvious at all if you don't know this relationship between width and size. It says the following. So let's try to read the statement without knowing this. Suppose we don't know just this relationship. It says that if a formula F, 3CNF, 
has a resolution refutation of certain size s, then the refutation or one refutation can be found, maybe not the same, but one refutation can be found in this time. So this time is exponential in the square root of n times log s. How good is this? Well, imagine s being polynomial. That's the case that we're most interested in. When we want to write the proof is because we expect it to fit in our memory, right? So when the formula has a small refutation, then we can find it in time exponential in the square root of n times log n. And that's a sub exponential time in the number of variables, which is quite non trivial. And why does it follow from the weird Benzeson Wigderson size width trade off? Well, that's because if you invert this relationship, then you get this function, basically. I mean, you see that this function is what you get. So you get an upper bound on the maximum width you need to look for. And that's basically the square root of n times log s. And how many clauses of that width are there? Well, no more than that right, n to the width. So n to the square root of n log n uh, is the running time of your algorithm, and that's basically exponential in n times log n. Great, so structural proof complexity gives you results for the proof search, and, and that's quite uh, quite a thing. And I'm not saying this is a practical algorithm, but it's a certainly non-trivial upper bound that is worth uh, uh, taking into account when uh, I mean, you really want to know this thing if it's true, right? So, so the, on the rest of the talk, I'm going to go over a selection of themes, and this is completely biased, uh, how I feel proof complexity has evolved. And these are four themes that I feel uh, that I have worked on and that I feel are the important things in proof, some of the important things in proof complexity. And two of these themes in, uh, are about uh, algorithmic uh, uh, theory of algorithms. So the first thing is about lower bounds, and I want to emphasize and also upper bounds. It's important to have upper bounds, and uh, we'll say why in a second. So here's an example, which is actually a theorem. It's a very non-trivial theorem of uh, Armin Haken, proved in 1986, where he showed that every resolution refutation of the pigeonhole hole principle formulas must be exponential in the number of variables, so in the number of uh, of pigeons. So this is the principle that says that if you have n plus one pigeons, you cannot send them injectively into n holes. Okay, so you have n plus one pigeons, two must sit in the same hole. And this you can express by a propositional formula with n square variables approximately. And Haken, by answering a question on in Cook's paper, 1971, he showed that uh, these formulas must be exponentially long. The refutations must be exponentially long. It is a contradiction, of course. The, the contradiction says that there is such a mapping from n plus one to n, and the contradiction is refutable in no length, in length no shorter than exponential. You can also show that there is an upper bound, which is doesn't follow immediately because uh, the number of variables of the formula is n square. So usually the trivial upper bound would be two to the n square, but there is a linear in the exponent upper bound. So two to the n is an upper bound also on the size of the proof. But that in that case, it cannot be tree-like because it can be shown that for tree-like, you need two to the n times log n. So these sort of things, is these sort of questions where you want to get tight upper bounds and, and seeing in which proof systems you can get them and, and why you want them to be tight because then you have understood to the end of the, to the bottom of it, uh, the problem. So, so this is the sort of questions that fall into theme one. There's another reason for studying this sort of lower bounds, which is a more modern one. Like uh, it has been found, it has found uses in, in the analysis of the so-called total function in NP problems. These are problems, NP search problems that are guaranteed to have a solution. And famous examples of this type are, you know, given a game, I find the Nash equilibrium, which is always guaranteed to exist by Nash theorem. And but also, for example, the pigeonhole principle is one of those, right? If you have a map, given you're given a circuit that maps uh, n plus one inputs, Boolean inputs to n outputs, then yeah, there have two to the n possible inputs and only two to the n plus one possible inputs and only two to the n outputs. So there must be two inputs that, that collide. So this is one of these TFNP classes. And this sort of lower bounds for the proof complexity of resolution give 
lower bounds in the black box model of TFNP classes. And this is a very simple example here, but uh, there are more sophisticated examples where you want to compare TFNP classes one with another. And then the methods of proof complexity for separating proof systems um, and saying this proof system, assuming this axiom cannot prove this other axiom, uh, this sort of uh, lower bounds has been useful for classifying the black box complexity of, of the FNP classes. So these are this is a classical theme, and I insist upper bounds are important because they're important, for example, in theme two. So theme two is the proof search or the automatability of, of proof systems. And this is, again, this duality between what Gödel was asking about is, uh, you know, finding a proof or that saying whether there is a proof and um, so finding one or uh, estimating whether there is one, right? So, so for proof search for propositional logic, there is this problem. You're given an unsatisfiable formula and that's a promise. So you, you can assume it's unsatisfiable and your task is to find a resolution refutation. And this is the proof search for resolution. Or you want to estimate the resolution proof length. So imagine you don't want, like Gödel, you don't really want a proof. You want to just know whether there is a proof of a certain size. And that could be useful because before running your um, your proof search, if you could estimate the size, then, then that would give you an idea whether it's worth running the proof search algorithm or not. If it's too long, it's not worth it. So it turns out that this problem is, was open for a long time. What is the exact proof complexity? Uh, sorry, the exact computational complexity of the problem until it was solved uh, in joint work with Moritz Müller, we managed to prove that it's NP hard to solve even very approximately. And I will give this now uh, in the next slide in what sense it can be uh, that it's NP hard to solve. What I want to say is that in, in this proof, both lower bounds, the methods for proving lower bounds and the methods for proving upper bounds or whatever, I mean, the upper bound, the analysis of upper bounds, both things were important in the proof. And to this result, there's been many follow-ups because the technique is quite general. So now we know similar results for three-leg resolution uh, under different assumptions, cutting planes for polynomial calculus and, and a few others. So, so let me say in the next slide, in what sense um, this problem is solved. Uh, so it's, it's NP hard to, to approximately find or approximately estimate the, the resolution proof length. So here's how the proof goes. This is what we do. So, and here's, uh, I want to emphasize the role of upper, of upper and lower bounds. So the non-automatability proof or the NP hardness of, of the problem goes as follows. So we start with three SAT. We have F, which is a three CNF formula, and we want to decide its satisfiability. So, and we are going to do this by reducing it to the proof search problem. The reduction goes by a polynomial time algorithm as usual with uh, polynomial time reductions, which produces another formula, G, which is another CNF, and it has the following conditions. If the original formula was satisfiable, then the minimum refutation size of G is small. It is almost linear. And I've written this like this because it's true and because I want to emphasize this, it's almost linear. But in, in any case, polynomial in the size of the formula. And this is polynomial itself. So it's this is polynomial in the size of F. Now, if F is unsatisfiable, then, and this is where the lower bound part came in, we had we needed to prove that this formula G that we constructed is exponentially hard. And this is an exponential gap between the upper bound and the lower bound. So this is big. And therefore, because there is this huge gap, uh, this means that you cannot tell, given a formula G, whether its proof length is polynomial or not, or whether it is anything in between, because that would allow you to decide satisfiability in polynomial time. So unless P equals NP, there's no way to tell, uh, to approximate the proof length of uh, uh, the resolution proof length. And therefore it is not possible to find proofs in time polynomial in the shortest proof, which is the what it means to be automatable. Now, I wanted to emphasize these, these bounds because they look quite similar to, to the Benson-Victorson algorithm. Remember, 
Benson Victorson uh, theorem gives you a non-trivial proof search algorithm. And that proof search gives you time complexity, which is exponential in the square root of the number of variables, essentially, times the, the proof length, logarithm of the proof length. So let's say polynomial proof length. So that means exponential in square root of n log n, where n is the number of variables. So here it's quite similar, right? So this is exponential in the square root of the size of the formula, and this is linear in the size of the formula. However, this is what we managed to prove, but this is, doesn't settle the question of whether the benson victorson algorithm is optimal. The reason is that this is measured in terms of the proof size uh, of the formula size and not in the number of variables. And, and what happens here is that this polynomial time reduction produces a formula that is polynomial in F, but it's not linear in F. So this, and, and you would need G to be almost linear or something like that. And so this is remains open from, from this work. And in fact, I believe it could be approachable by getting more, I mean, optimizing this reduction and getting better better parameters in this formula G. And that would be quite nice because it would show that the benson victorson algorithm is actually optimal. So this is one open problem that is left in this field, which is the theme two, I'm going back to the slide, theme two proof search and automatability. So uh, Albert? Yes? Just to clarify, so you're asking for the these bounds to be like tighter in, in terms of the number of variables in the original formula F, is that right? That's, ex that's exactly right. It would be great if G had a linear number of variables in F, in the number of variables of F, and also a linear number of clauses. And very often this can be achieved by doing encoding tricks that are better than what we did, like uh, using binary encoding for pointers, uh, using expanders uh, for certain complete graphs that we use in our formula. So it might be doable. But uh, I have to admit, I mean, I tried, but uh, it didn't get too far. I also moved to other things. So. Okay, thanks for the question. Thanks. Theme three. Uh, so this, we start now with algorithms. So one theme that uh, came uh, quite uh, late, I mean, not late, I think it's, uh, the, the results here started in the early 2000s which was in the application of uh, proof complexity to the analysis of heuristics. And here I want to give some examples. So one thing is the analysis of the average case complexity of certain problems, for example, on erdos any random graphs or on random formulas, random three set formulas. Uh, also for approximation algorithms and for heuristic analysis in, for example, algorithms like SAT solving where, you know, uh, the SAT solvers, these are algorithms that uh, decide whether a formula is satisfiable or uh, find a refutation in resolution of its unsatisfied proof of unsatisfiability. And these algorithms are very efficient, but they are based on heuristics that nobody really fully understands why they are so successful. So it would be nice to apply the methods of proof complexity to analyze the heuristics and to, to be able to classify and say, okay, this heuristic is theoretically superior to this other because of this and that. Okay, so let me, uh, I won't go too much uh, into the heuristic analysis for SAT solving, but I'll discuss a little bit this average case complexity. Uh, before I go there, I'll talk about another theme that I find very interesting and that is related to this, which is the theme of uh, algebraic and semi-algebraic proof systems. So basically, uh, we have been talking so far about propositional proof systems and this is still talking about propositional proof systems in the sense that they are proof systems for propositional logic. The difference is that now the formulas we reason with are no longer propositional formulas themselves, but they are polynomials over some field or some ring. So here is um, the setup. So we're still thinking of propositional formulas, but now we encode uh, clauses by polynomials. So for example, the variables, first of all, we, we put them in pairs, a variable and it's uh, twin variable, as I call it, x and x prime, which stand for complementary variables, x and not x. And this now they range over some field, reals, rationals, integers, or integers is a ring, not a field, but uh, some ring. And now you constrain the variables 
by requiring them to take values zero and one. And so this means you put these as axioms, x squared minus x equals zero. Um, they are only satisfied by zero and one, but you put this axiom as a syntactical equation. And also you require that x prime is the dual or the complementary uh, value of x. So x plus x prime minus one is equal to zero. And other clauses like x or y or not z become polynomial constraints, where in this case, the way we are encoding this is by x prime times y prime times z equals zero. So let's see if the clause is true. It means that one of the literals is true. And that means that one of the complementary literals is zero. That's exactly when this equation is, is, uh, is satisfied, is made zero. Okay, so now we are representing the clauses as uh, polynomials. And now the inferences uh, the inference rule are going to be polynomial identities over this ring or field. And these are the case of algebraic proofs. Polynomial calculus, you may have heard as a word, that's an algebraic proof system. Semi-algebraic proof systems, these are um, proof systems that work where the field is the reals and we work with inequalities. So now an equality between two polynomials, P and Q, you see that there's two inequalities, P minus Q is non-negative and Q minus Q is non-negative. And you want to infer new inequalities from old ones. And for example, we can allow, and this is this defines different proof systems, we can allow, for example, arbitrary monomial inequalities as axioms. And why is that? Well, because our variables are still restricted to be 0, 1. So a monomial, a product of monomial uh, of variables that are 0, 1 is definitely always non-negative. So you can allow arbitrary monomials as axioms, or even arbitrary squares of polynomials of any type. Uh, P square, you allow this as an axiom. And this gives you different proof system depending on what you allow. So for example, here are two proof systems. The sum of squares proof system that you may have heard. Another one that I'm making up the name is sum of monomials proof systems. So what's the difference? Well, in both cases, the inference is going to be a polynomial identity. So we have a CNF formula with these clauses, C1 to CM and these variables, X1 to Xn. And then we have a polynomial identity which is going to be guaranteed to be non-negative by the axioms. So first of all, these AIs are going to be the clauses of uh, my formula or uh, the Boolean axioms that I introduced earlier for xi, minus, xi square minus xi equals zero. That's a Boolean axiom. So you, any axiom of that type is allowed. Any clause encoded as a polynomial is allowed here. And now that, because those things are supposed to equal zero, you can leave them by any polynomial. And this whole sum is going to be postulated to be zero. So you can allow it in your polynomial identity and whatever is on the right is going to be non-negative if this is non-negative. How do we make sure that this is non-negative? Well, by enforcing it in the following way. So these coefficients, you ask them to be non-negative coefficients. And these things, you ask them to be syntactically non-negative because they are either squares or sums of monomials. Or, yeah, monomials. In the case of sum of squares, you, you allow squares and, and therefore sums of squares. And in the case of uh, sum of monomials, you allow monomials and therefore sums of monomials. So that these are the two proof systems. Anything you can get by such a, an expression like P is guaranteed to be non-negative on any assignment that satisfies the clauses. In particular, if the clauses are unsatisfiable, then it should be possible to deduce, or put it the other way, if you can deduce minus one from the, your clauses, then you know that the clauses are unsatisfiable. What do we measure as a proof here? This is the proof, syntactically, this is what the proof is, but we measure the degree of the components, uh, like in much in the same way we are measuring width in the case of resolution, here we measure degree. And another measure that is important is the monomial size, which is how many monomials you see when you expand these little products here and these squares. And you sum up the number of monomials. Of course, the total thing, because it may vanish, right? It may be minus one if it's a refutation, the whole thing could vanish and then you're left without any monomials. So you're not counting the number of monomials in the whole expression. That's That could be too much simplification. You're counting the monomials in the actual proof, which is in these little components that make up your proof. All right, so this is a proof uh, 
complexity of uh, sum of squares and sum of monomials. And what is the point of this thing? Well, the point is that it allows to go beyond clauses. So clauses don't give you the power to reason, uh, to count, because clauses are very limited in expressive power. But you don't want to go all the way to Boolean formulas of arbitrary complexity, because this is too much complexity. And therefore, the proof search becomes too hard. So you stay somewhere in the middle by allowing these polynomials in our reasoning. And for example, we can do things like the pigeonhole principle. Now they become easy for some of squares monomial size. So here are three facts. Pigeonhole is hard for resolution size and hard for resolution width, and that's from Haken's theorem. Now for some of monomials, pigeonhole principle becomes easy, meaning that there is a polynomial proof with in some of monomials with a polynomial number of monomials. But it's still hard if you measure by degree, in the sense that it requires linear degree, linear in the number of pigeons. While if you go to sum of squares, then it becomes easy in both sense. It in both senses, it is polynomial size in the monomial size and uh, constant degree. And here is the proof. In fact, that this is an identity, and this is how it is based. I'm not going to go all the details of this identity. It's basically expressing that. At most one pigeon sits in every hole and, and that you can deduce by an identity. All right, so, so I'm going very slowly. So let me uh, go over. So what are the tools that uh, have been used for, for, for this proof complexity? One important thing is the semantic characterizations of proof measures. So, so we want to understand provability in the sense that which formulas have uh, refutations but also which formulas do not have low complexity refutation. So, and the answer to this is that the formulas that don't have low complexity refutation are those that are locally satisfiable in a certain sense. And this is important for designing algorithms as I will discuss now. So here is my visualization of local satisfiability. This is the uh, picture of uh, Escher ascending and descending stairs. So you can see here that these people are walking up the stairs uh, all the time, right? So. This is not something that can happen in reality. So this is globally, this doesn't, it's not consistent. But if you look locally at it, it's perfectly okay. So it's a satisfiable, um, locally you can satisfy this in reality. This is okay, these are stairs going up and these are stairs going up. This is the rest of the building. So this is fine, but if you put it globally, then this is not realizable in, in, physic, in the physical world. So this is, a, uh, uh, a visualization of the local satisfiability. And this is what happens in the with K prover adversary game for resolution, where you want to tell, you want to characterize when is it that the formula doesn't have low complexity refutations. And the claim is that it happens precisely when an adversary can claim that the formula is locally satisfiable in the sense that it cannot be distinguished it can, uh, locally from a contradiction. Uh, from a true formula, from a satisfiable formula. So suppose you have a CNF formula and you have a set of partial assignments of with W, and then you have this game where the positions are these partial assignments. And then there are two moves that uh, the prover can do. He, he can query a variable and the adversary assigns a variable a value to this variable. And this happens if we haven't reached the locality bounds, we have certain locality bound W. So the prover can say, what variable, what value do you give to this variable? And the adversary gives a value. Or you have shrinking moves, like at every moment, the prover suggests to discard some earlier assignments and the adversary accepts. So if this game can go on forever and without reaching a partial assignment that falsifies some clause, then the formula looks as if it were satisfiable. And this in fact characterizes, and I'm jumping ahead one slide, this characterizes the existence of resolution width so there is no resolution with refutation. It happens precisely when there is a winning strategy for adversary in the with W game that I just described. This is not a difficult theorem, but it's extremely useful for because it characterizes the non-existence of low proofs. And in fact, it is also useful in the sense that it has a very similar uh, formulation for linear programming and semi-definite programming hierarchies, which correspond to sum of monomials and sum of squares proofs. And these lights are meant to be exact analogs of the ones that I um, discussed for resolution in the sense that there is no degree W 
sum of squares proof, if and only if there is a feasible solution to a certain semi-definite program. And this semi-definite program looks extremely similar to the game that we described. So we can go over the details in the second part if you want to do this. So let me now, in the last 20 minutes, talk about the analysis of heuristics, or maybe, let's see, so, or maybe the analysis of algorithms. What should we do? Because I'm, I don't have time to do everything. So maybe I'll go to, yeah, I'll go to the coloring and I'll skip the, I'll skip the click part. I'll go to the coloring because there's where new algorithms can, can appear. So let me skip the click part and let's go to the coloring problem. So, here, what we want to do is to apply the methods of proof complexity to analyze algorithms for the coloring problem in graphs. So the coloring problem is this, you're given a graph G and an integer Q, and you want to ask, uh, the question is whether G can be colored with Q colors without monochromatic edges. So the two endpoints of the edges of every edge should get different colors. And that's of course the chromatic number is the smallest number of colors with which you can do this. The computational complexity of the coloring problem is well known, is uh, NP complete for any Q bigger than or equal than three. It also appears to be hard on average around this probability where you take a graph N with N vertices and edge probability about Q log Q over N. So the expected number of edges is something like Q log Q times N. And um, around this number of linear number of edges when Q is fixed, this problem appears to be hard, meaning that all algorithms that are known fail to produce a refutation or, or a proof that it's Q colorable. In fact, approximating the chromatic number, this is the notation, is a major open problem. Uh, whether it can be done efficiently, uh, sub exponential time or polynomial time, or whether it's NP hard to even approximate very, very um, crudely. So, so how do we analyze this from proof complexity point of view? So one way is by encoding it as a formula. So you have Boolean variables for every vertex and for every color, and you say vertex U is colored I. And then you have clauses that say that every vertex U, for every vertex you have a clause saying that it takes one of the Q colors, but for every edge and every color, uh, it's not the case that uh, both endpoints are colored I. So this is the encoding, and this is called the unary encoding for the coloring formula. For, for the, yeah, unary encoding. So the resolution complexity was studied uh, for, for the coloring formulas in uh, early 2000s. And, and here is uh, the question was asked is what is the worst case average case resolution complexity of these formulas? And the motivation for it is what resolution happens to be powerful enough to simulate many backtracking algorithms. And they give an example, and this is beautiful. And a beautiful example, I want to go over it. This is the so-called MacDiarmid calculus, which is a way to produce all non-Q colorable graphs. So for now, think of it as a proof search, as a proof, uh, as a, as a proof system, and, but you can think of it as a backtracking algorithm. So you want to produce all non-Q colorable graphs. And the axioms are, of course, the Q plus one peaks are not Q colorable, right? So you take this as axioms. I mean, there's it's, there's no doubt that those are not Q colorable. So you are always allowed to introduce a K plus, Q plus one click. Now there are two inference rules. One says that if uh, a graph G is a subgraph of another graph H, and G has been derived as non-Q colorable, then of course H is not Q colorable, so you can derive it. That's your first inference rule, subgraph inference rule. Second inference rule is a bit more clever. It says that if you have a non-edge of H, and by adding this edge, you get a graph that is already non-Q colorable and you have uh, derived that, then when you identify the two endpoints of this non-edge, the graph that you get, if that is also derived, that is also non-Q colorable, then H itself is not Q colorable. And if you think of this is in fact a resolution step in, this, in the sense because, well, if H were Q colorable, then um, either the two endpoints, of this UV would get uh, the same color or different colors. If they get different colors, then this one would also be Q colorable. 
And if you get different color, uh, equal colors, then this one would be equal color. So there is a case analysis on whether they get the same color or different color in a supposed Q coloring of H, which doesn't exist. So the soundness is basically this case analysis. And so what they proved in this 2005 paper is that the non-Q colorability of a graph has a tree like McDiarmid proof in this proof system I just described. If and only if, no, sorry. If this happens, it's not even only if. If this happens, then the formula has a refutation of small width. Q, remember, we think of it as a constant. So the width is something like logarithm in the proof size. And as a consequence of this, they got exponential lower bounds on random graphs around you know, for a linear number of edges uh, on the width and on the size. So what the, the importance of this theorem is that you prove it once for resolution. You prove that these graphs are hard for resolution and therefore they are hard for many backtracking algorithms. For example, those that McDiarmid introduced and many others. So it's a meta theorem in the sense that it gives you proof complexity for many other, um, lower bounds for many other algorithms. But it also gives you understanding of, of the problem. So for example, uh, so what can I say here? Uh, because I mean, this makes more sense if I had done the click part uh, because I haven't done the click part. So well, how much time do I have? I have five minutes. So I think I should skip this. I think you're in charge of the exact time planning, Albert. So, you know, if you want five minutes extra, you have it. And whoever doesn't want to join can just zoom out. So it's like, you know. Yeah, OK. So so let me do one thing. I'll try to get to the algorithm that I want to discuss. And if I, if and then we'll go back to the here if we, if we want also. So yeah, so I skipped that, those two little slides because now I want to talk about the problem of approximate chromatic number and, and to discuss a new algorithm that uh, we found recently. It's, it's, I mean, it's not solving the problem, but it's giving something. <laughs> so approximate chromatic number, you have two integers, P and Q, and you want to have this problem. Given a P colorable graph, you want to find a Q coloring. Now think of Q as being a lot bigger, for example then this should be relatively easier, right? Uh, I mean, if you are given a three colorable graph and you're asked to 25 color it, then in principle, it should be easier no? than three coloring. So this is a promise problem because there is a promise and that the graph is P colorable, but you're only required to produce a Q coloring. Q could be bigger. Now, as a decision problem, this is kind of equivalent, so to speak, or at least, um, no harder. So you're given a graph G and it's promised to be either P colorable or not even Q colorable. So there is this gap. There's a, there's a gap in the promise. So you are required to tell which is the case. So if the graph is P colorable, you're supposed to say yes. If the graph is not even Q colorable, you're supposed to say no. So you want to distinguish graphs that are colorable with very few colors from graphs that require many colors. Now, this problem is very famous, like uh, the three versus three. It means distinguishing three colorable from non-three colorable graphs. This is NP-complete, well known. It's also NP-complete to distinguish three colorable graphs from graphs that are not, not even four colorable, but that is already very non-trivial. It requires PCP machinery. It was done in the early 2000s. Now, if you want to distinguish three versus five, so now it gets easier and easier to solve the problem, but it's still NP-complete. But this requires, besides the PCP theorem and the PCP machinery, it requires also universal algebra. And it was proved only very recently that it's NP-complete. It's quite it's getting harder and harder to, to get the hardness results. Now, three versus six or three versus Q for Q larger, it's not known whether it's NP-complete. It, it is known to be NP-complete, assuming the D21 conjecture, uh, which is a version of the unique games conjecture that I'm not going to discuss. It's not clear whether to believe this conjecture or not, but it definitely it gives some uh, insight or on, on, on this problem, but it doesn't completely solve yet. It's NP-completeness. But the one would of... be stronger than unique games in terms of like in terms of conjecture strength, or it's yes. comparable? It's stronger. It's stronger. It's strong. It's more likely to be false. 
Um, okay, and there's no consensus. Now, if you want to find the first case that is polynomial, that you can distinguish three colorable graphs from two colorable graphs, then you need to go to an unbounded number of colors. So the first one was this famous Wigderson algorithm of 1983, where he, in polynomial time, distinguished graphs that are three colorable from graphs that are not even square root of n colorable. N is the number of vertices. So there's a huge gap between the NP completeness and the polynomial time case. Now, this one half here has been improved several times. Uh, it's getting better and better. And, and the last or the current record is something below one fifth, so 0 0.199. But it's still some polynomial function of it. Okay, so what can we say here? So I want to discuss Wigderson's algorithm and see it as a width-based algorithm. And this is very straightforward and easy, but uh, it had not been observed before. And it has some consequence. So, so let me discuss Wigderson's algorithm. In fact, this is a stronger version of Wigderson's algorithm, and this is a starting point. So what we're going to show is that, or argue, is that if the graph, it's, I mean, you don't need it to be three colorable. If it's not refutable in width three, it's three colorability is not refutable in width three, constant width, then we can conclude that it's already square root of n colorable. So the lack of refutations gives you a non-trivial structural result, okay? And, and that is already enough to distinguish uh, three colorable graphs from graphs that are not square root of n colorable. Right? Because if it's three colorable, then it's definitely not refutable. So it's, color it's, it's three colorable, then uh, that's the promise. Then, then it's called three colorability is not refutable in any width, right? But we don't need the three colorability. Of course, that would be a trivial statement. If it's three colorable, then of course it's square root of n colorable. But this is not a trivial statement. It's saying that if it's if it's three colorability is not refutable in width three, then it's already square root of n colorable. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, this is basically uh, the analysis of Wigderson. It goes as follows. So, well, we want this is what we want to prove. If it's not the three colorability is not refutable in width three, then we have two cases. So either every vertex has a small degree, and in that case we can argue that it's square root of n colorable by coloring greedily. Notice that I'm not saying. I mean, this is a polynomial time procedure, but um, it doesn't have to. I mean, just want to argue that it's square root of n colorable, and it definitely is if all the degrees are small. Now, what happens if you have some vertex of large degree? Well, in that case, I claim that the vertex and its neighborhood is three colorable. Um, notice that this is not in the hypothesis. The hypothesis says that three, that the refutation of three colorability cannot be done with three. So but I'm claiming that this graph is three colorable. So why is that? Well, Suppose this graph is not three colorable, then the neighborhood alone it would not be two colorable because you would color the neighborhood and then add one more color for the center. Yes. So if it's not three colorable, then the neighborhood is not two colorable. But the non two colorability is refutable in width two because this is the two sat formula. This, you have only two colors. And if you have two colors, then the clause that says that every vertex gets one color has width two. So this is a two sat, two CNF formula, and therefore the non two colorability is, the, the two colorability is refutable in width two. But then when you add back the vertex U, then you can refute it in width three, because basically you can add, I mean, this is what this, adding this vertex means adding this clause, and then you can resolve this clause with all the uh, clauses that say that the neighbors get one of three colors, but uh, one of them will be uh, removed. It's a case analysis on what, are, what is the color on you. It's one of three. And whatever color it is, the neighborhoods uh, have this vertex uh, forbidden. And therefore, you can reduce the width to refutation of the neighborhood to get a width three refutation of what you want. Um, but then if a subgraph of the original graph 
is refutable in width three, then the whole graph is refutable in width three. And that's against our hypothesis. So the claim, therefore, is that it is three colorable. Sorry, now, I have a question. Yeah. Where are you using the fact that, uh, this, I mean, the square root of n? I don't see in the argument where it's. Used. Yeah, so here it is. So here, now what I'm going to do is this is only a part of the graph. But what is the size of this graph? I haven't finished. That's why you don't see it. So uh -huh. this graph has size the square root of n. Yes, because it's the neighborhood. I'm assuming u has degree square root of n. So this graph has size square root of n. So now I can remove this graph and re proceed recursively on the rest of the graph with three new colors. And how many times I do that? Square root of n times, I get three times square root of n. That's my big O of square root of n. Okay, so this is Victorson's algorithm, but then with Victor Dalmau, we said, can we generalize this? And we did look at it and we got similar results, which it goes as follows. If the graph three, uh, the graph is, its three colorability is not refutable in some sublinear width, and this is one minus two epsilon here in the exponent, then we can get into the epsilon colorable. And this is for any epsilon, like 0 0.00001. And the corollary of this, the proof of this is relatively similar, and I can go over the de details after the break if you want. The, the details uh, are that, but the consequence is uh, similar. You get an algorithm that solves the three versus n to the epsilon, and this is any epsilon, 0 0.0001, in some exponential time, which is, okay, that doesn't look so fantastic, but it's actually good because it's exponential n to the one minus two epsilon. Now notice this is in the exponent of the exponent. So any improvement in this uh, is significant. And if you think of it, there is a naive algorithm of this complexity, exponential in n to the one minus epsilon. So what is this naive algorithm, in fact? Well, it's very, it's quite straightforward. In fact, you can, you can break the graph into parts of size n to the epsilon. How many? n to the one minus epsilon, and three color each, each part. And then once you have colored all parts, then you are left with uh, a square root. Um, sorry, you, you break it into parts of n to the one minus epsilon. So each one has size n to the epsilon, and you use three colors for each part. But that gives you time exponential in n to the one minus epsilon, which is the number of uh, this, because you need to loop over all three colorings of uh, every part, and that's exponential. So the improvement here is in this epsilon versus two epsilon. Doesn't look terribly good, but it's better than any known algorithm in the literature. So we, we, we did the search, we asked the experts, and these two cannot be achieved by current methods, even semi-definite programming methods or anything. So, okay, so I can discuss this uh, proof, which is one slide uh, uh, after the break. Let me now wrap up uh, the talk and and I'll get questions. So, so I did a little bit of a survey on proof complexity, what, uh, what I feel are the main themes of, in, definitely of my research in proof complexity. So here are some themes we talked about lower and upper bounds, and I think upper bounds are important um, because they match the lower bounds and therefore tell us that we, we got exactly where we were. And we needed this for the proof search and the non-automatability -auto results, we needed the upper bound. There is some open problems there and uh, to match the benson victorson algorithm. We also talked about that. We discussed a bit of analysis of heuristics. We skipped the click part, but uh, uh, we discussed a bit of uh, coloring. And the algebraic and semi-algebraic proof systems I had to, to, to skip uh, from this analysis. There are many other themes, like uh, the theme of optimal proof systems, uh, meta complexity, which is what does it take to prove a lower bound? What is the proof complexity of the statement that you have a proof complexity lower bound? And all these things I had to skip. So some of problems is like, uh, well, the click I didn't discuss, so, so I'm not saying it here. For coloring formulas, it turns out that the, the, the degree complexity for density q square over n is open. And this is solved for resolution. 
the, the beam and others uh, paper solves this for resolution, but for some of monomials and for some of squares, it's widely open. There are worst case graphs where um, you have lower bounds for some of squares, but not on average. And also, yeah, I didn't get to discuss the explicit obstructions, but one thing that uh, is important in this theory is that the encodings are not irrelevant. Um, Usually we think that the encoding doesn't matter, but in fact, I think it, they do matter. And at least to me, it's not obvious that you can translate results from, for example, things you can get from Lovar's theta, the analysis of Lovar's theta function, uh, how you translate them directly into proof complexity when you encode your formulas as CNFs. It's not completely clear to me that it can be done, or at least, a better theory of encodings would be important here. And I think uh, that's something for future work. So yeah, I'll stop here and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Albert, for uh, clapping on behalf of the entire audience and we'll open up for questions. Um, Albert. Yes. Thank you very much for this very, very nice overview. And I really like this Dalmo theorem, 22. Could you go back to this slide? The Which one? Dalmo. Or, uh, I don't know how, know how yeah. to pronounce it. It's German pronunciation, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so okay. yeah, go with Dalmo. It is really uh, something. My question is, have you ever thought, or maybe it's, is it a good idea for you if you try to general, generalize this idea so if you go to the title of the talk to find algorithmic approaches to do something better, if you have some algorithmic ideas. So if you generalize the principle, you have a kind of formula um, and maybe three CNF, you start with three CNF and you put some restrictions on this. You really precisely describe these descriptions, uh, these restrictions, you could say, take something like uh, something using the CSP uh, dichotomy theory, you could uh, using a variant like a, the, the famous one that has a CSP. So for instance, not all equal set or, uh, uh, or say um, one into three set or something, or you, you could put any restriction maybe you think of. And then you say, if this kind of formula that is not refutable within with something. Is there any way to, to have a conclusion that you can prove that this is then, that uh, formula is then satisfiable? Do you think yeah. that is a sense, sensible idea? Yeah, sorry. So yeah, definitely it is a sensible idea. Thanks for the question. Okay, sorry. thank you. I'm, uh, I did something wrong with my camera. <laughs> I really would, uh, if I'm uh, really a little bit in this, uh, th uh, um, things like this are really mind boggling, have been mind boggling uh, to me for a longer time. To, well, you, let me put it like this you have, you really brilliantly pre presented this overview of this literature. You have, for instance, this thing with a K set. You, you, you know, there is no resolution refutation that. There is a, a upper bound, a lower bound that is something exponential, already proven. That says to me it's easy to, not not easy, but you know it's a very beginning literature. And um, but if you put some restriction on it, nobody has yet, as far as I know, for instance, for, for some interesting restrictions. Well, because there are so many possibilities. Maybe there's a way to 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 do something to to make use of it. So, so let me. There is a there is some answers to this. So, for example, as you were saying, it uh, came to my mind. So, for example, if your graph, yeah, has small tree width, yeah, tree width, it's similar to a graph. So, so let's say you're you're looking for k clicks on graphs of tree width twenty five k. Okay. Yeah. You can you can have k clicks in graphs of three with twenty five k, so there you can show that with k refutations are complete mm -hmm. with with twenty five k <laughs> with twenty five k. So this means that if if the k click formula on 
is not 25k refutable, then you know there is a k click. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So this sort of thing is yeah, this sort of thing is known. This is on putting restrictions on the formula on the structure of the formula. Now here is that the graph is not an arbitrary graph, but it's a graph that has a certain structure. On the other hand, you were asking for uh, restrictions. You were putting it as an example, but I'll take your example, which is restrictions on the kind of constraints, like uh, you have an auto equal and so on. So in this case, it's also understood when refutability in width k gives you completeness. And that's the constraints that have so-called bounded width <laughs> or, and, and, or that are solvable, whose CSP is solvable in data log. And this is completely classified. It's completely understood which CSPs are solvable in bounded width and which are not. Ah, cool. So yeah. these sort of restrictions are completely classified. And this is a, some work I did based on the dichotomy conjecture for bounded width. Uh, some work I did with Joanna that I see she is in the in the audience. Oh, cool. Uh, uh, I think we should uh, continue this offline. Maybe I okay. will think about it and then address it to you. Okay, thank you. So, Albert, one thing I wanted to ask in this statement of this uh, Matteo Dalmau theorem, the new one, um, which um, confused me a bit when you stated first. So, so where does the proof system come into the picture? Because you're just stating it as refutable without any reference to a proof system. And I guess you're not uh, really, so like where, where, where are we using that this is resolution? Are we using this for the algorithmic upper bound? Yes, uh, it's so it's because it's the game. So being not refutable in with something, it means that there is a winning strategy for the adversary. Right, and that's used in the algorithm. So let me see here. It's used in the structural result here. So here, because it goes by contradiction, it's clear where the proof system goes. No, I mean, if it's a two such formula, the fact that we're talking about with two is, I mean, it's important that we're talking about with two to get uh, to get the structural result. No. Yes, and what? But okay, so um, yes, yeah, so I guess would it make sense to, yeah, to plug in another proof system where this would not okay. buy you anything or what? Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's because a very this... confused question. Sorry, but no, 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 it makes it makes sense. Okay, because here I'm not using the algorithm to find refutations of certain width. Um, it's not important that this is width automatable, right? So it is. It's only the structural result is important that when you have a two sat formula, then it's refutable in constant width. That's the only thing I'm using. So if the, the this analysis this ended up being some other formula that has some refutation in some other proof system like sum of squares or whatever bounded degree sum of squares, then you could use that part. So indeed. Yes, you get stronger algorithms. You definitely get something stronger if here you put not refutable in the green something in polynomial calculus, for example. So the, it's conceivable that this gets improved by making the proof system stronger. Does it make sense? Um, Yes, that's what I was thinking, but for some reason, maybe it's Friday afternoon, but I, I like I don't exactly see how 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 this would propagate to give a strong result, but maybe I just need to think about it offline. Well, no, I don't know. Uh, let me see the the automatability, the, the width automatability, I'm using it to get the algorithm, right? Because this is only a structural result, but in the end, if you want to get an algorithm, you need to be able to decide whether this condition holds or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Because how would you do it if it um, if it doesn't hold? If the condition doesn't hold, then um, then of course it's not recoverable. Because if it's refutable, then it's not recoverable. And if it holds, then by this structural result, you know that it's square root of n colorable. So, so the algorithm requires checking this condition. And therefore, you do need a proof system for which um, checking the condition is feasible. 
In fact, in, in the stronger this, this Dalmau, Archeria Dalmau theorem, the reason we get an algorithm of exponential complexity is because that's what it takes to check this width condition. Uh -huh. But the point is that it's better than the trivial thing. Uh -huh. yeah. Any other questions? Um, hi, Albert. Hi, sure. Uh, I'm wondering what happens if you change the number three to four in this on this page. Excellent question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't work. <laughs> so this doesn't work at all because it relies on the fact that when you fix one color, the neighborhood uh, restricts its number of the colors from three to two, and two colorability is 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 feasible, is tractable. So if you have four, then uh, you're reducing from four to three, and then you are in the hard case. So. The answer is that I don't know. Excuse me, may I ask a question? Of course. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering the weakness of the hypothesis of those Dalmo's results and uh, Wigdorson's uh, algorithm with with a based algorithm. Um, is there any interesting class of graphs which is not recolorable but uh, has no refutation in small depth uh, width? And is there any concrete examples? Um, so, which one should we think of? Um, yeah. So this one. Yeah, this is fine. So you want a class of graphs that is not three colorable, but also not refutable in small width. Yes, as that is, for example, solved by this beam result that I mentioned somewhere, like here. Here it is. So if you take a random graph with edge probability one over n, let's say q equals three, then the width is linear in n. Mm -hmm. More than one of them. So this class of graphs is an example. And you can also find explicit such graphs. Oh, I see. Oh, thank you very much. I got it. You're welcome. So uh, thank you so much again, Albert, for this presentation. I think maybe we'll uh, end the at least online questions here. So thank you again. Yeah.